Hey friends, it's good to be there with you in your home or in your car, wherever you're watching. 
whatever device or platform you're watching on. Stay tuned for a great time of worship together and an encouraging message of truth in God's word. God bless you and your family as you watch today. a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, that you might declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness and into his glorious light. You were saved for praise. Give him glory for all that he is and all that he's done. We bless you, Lord.
The greatest wireless connection is prayer. When we agree together, we can expect God to intervene and do miracles for us. Listen, there's a prayer tab right over here in the corner. Click that and you will be connected to a staff member here at Calvary Christian Center and you can have a confidential time of prayer. We wanna agree with you to believe God for miracles in your family, in your health, or whatever it is that you wanna see take place in your life. Click on the prayer tab and listen, wherever you're watching, maybe it's YouTube or some other platform, uh, please leave a comment below and we would love to hear from you. Thanks. God says in his word, those who honor me, I will honor. And those who dishonor me will not receive my blessing. That's an interesting comment that God makes about humanity. Honor is a big, big deal with God. And then he goes on to say, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your increase. I'll fill your barns to overflowing and your vats will also overflow. I'll, go, I'll take care of you out of my abundance. That's God's promise to those of us who say, we will honor you by bringing to you the tithe because it's yours and we will obey you and that's where the honor is expressed in our obedience. I will obey you and honor you and bring offering and, and give thanks to you for all you are to me and all you've provided for me. I'm always honored every single Sunday, Sunday to honor the God who's blessed me and give back to him what belongs to him. So I bring him the tithe and I give him an offering and I do it cheerfully because God loves it when we come to him with gracious hearts of thanksgiving. So today, as you bring your tithe, you may come by the church. It may be through mail. You may go to our website and use that opportunity for online giving. Whichever way you do it, be sure in your giving, you're honoring the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your increase. God says, I will fill your barns and I will also cause your vats to overflow. I will bless you back. I'll honor you back is what God is saying to us. I want to thank you for your loyalty and your faithfulness. You have helped us immensely by continuing to be honorable and faithful in the way that you've given. We've been able to take care of the maintenance of our facilities, take care of our people that serve us and work together here on our campus. We're able to minister to the needs of others 
to the best of our ability, and also, in the middle of all this, make sure we maintain our campus, and we're in the middle of a renovation in our gymnasium, coming up on Memorial Day. So we've had a lot of different things happening at once, but thank you for loving God and honoring Him and making sure that the work of the Lord continues to go forward. May God bless you. I want you to know I love you. I'm appreciative to you. Have a fantastic week serving Jesus. Welcome Calvary Christian Center family. We're here on Memorial Day weekend and welcome to our online service today here from our church sanctuary. We're so glad that you've joined us for a celebration of worship and prayer and God's word. I want to remind you that I'm in a short series on the topic of what is essential. We talked about essential prayer. And today I want to talk to you about essential praise. Praising God is essential. In the book of Exodus it says, when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Israel saw amazing miracles that God did for them when he freed them from slavery and bondage in Egypt. By the time Israel left Egypt, they left with uh, the wealth of Egypt. Plagues had destroyed the economy of Egypt and their crops and their her herds, but the gold and the silver and the, and the fine linens were taken by the Israelis as they left Egypt and well taken care of. Israel feared the Lord and Israel believed the Lord. And Israel then sang this wonderful song of praise. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me the victory. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The children of Israel or led by the Holy Spirit under the cloud of witness into a very challenging and difficult situation. They're surrounded. The Red Sea is dead ahead of them. There are mountains on either side of them. And here comes the Egyptian army after them, trying to once again enslave them, if not kill them in the wilderness. And, and fear has entered the camp of Israel. And the people begin to rebel against Moses. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. And they cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this was going to happen? While we were still there in Egypt, we said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Man, they got things really in reverse in a hurry. Fear causes people to get off the rails. A cry had come up from the people of Israel. Can you imagine the roar of that crowd that rose up against Moses? Moses was in on the plan of God for Israel's deliverance. The Lord had told him what was about to happen, yet Moses becomes so overwhelmed because of their desperation, he falls on his knees and he begins to cry to the Lord. And then God spoke to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to go get moving. God told Moses, tell them to get up and let's go for it. God created a wind strong enough to open the sea, and Israel marched into their miracle. They walked on dry ground at night across the seabed of the Red Sea. So then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers, chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud and threw their forces into total confusion. The Egyptian army is caught in the sea as they attempt to chase after Israel to destroy them. But God sprung a trap and they were never seen again. So as the sun began to rise, 
Moses raised his hand up over the sea and the water rushed back into its usual place as the Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. And then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh, of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. Now, safely on the other side of the Red Sea, Israel began to praise the Lord and sing to him. Now they believe. Now they've seen the miracle. Now that the sea has opened and they've walked across on dry ground, out come all the tambourines, out come the dancers. They sing a beautiful song of praise. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me the victory. And they praise the Lord. Well, this was the right song, but sung at the wrong time. They sing this beautiful song of praise, but this is the song and praise that God desired for them to give him on the testing side because anyone can sing to the Lord and praise the Lord after they've received their victory. You see, after the victory, anyone can express thanksgiving. That's what that is. It's thanksgiving for what God has done. But how about when we're facing the test? to be able, without seeing the end, to be able to praise God, that's faith. To look straight into the eye of the storm and say, I thank God for who he is in my life, you see. But when we're facing darkness, what about when we face the future? What about when we don't understand what's happening around us? When everything looks hopeless? You know, it's kind of natural for us to respond in fear When stuff begins to happen, we don't understand. I mean, if you were there on that day in that crisis, would you not have trembled when you saw the taskmasters and the army of the Egyptians coming out to kill you and destroy you? Would your faith not have wavered a little bit in the middle of that? Had that storm erupted in your life in that circumstance, how would you have reacted in the middle of that tragedy that seemed to be coming down on all of them? Now, there's a time where we vent human fear, when we express it. There are moments when human fear of the unknown future brings all of us to a place where we feel paralyzed for the moment. And you ask, as they did, how are we going to survive this? Some are asking that right now in the middle of this plague that we've all experienced now, going on about 10 weeks. The human thought is, God Why don't you cut them a little slack? I mean, you know, they've known nothing but slavery all of their lives. They've been subjugated. They've been beaten. They've been abused. Did God expect that his people are going to praise him when everything looks so bleak out there in the wilderness? And here we are in our day. People are losing jobs. Unemployment has reached all-time highs. People carrying way too much burden and stress Our government overspending, top heavy with bureaucrats and corruption, people panicked by the hype and overstating of the facts. I mean, it seems like it rains on the just and on the unjust, just like Jesus said it would. So as we go through this test, do you feel like praising? Do you feel like singing? Do you feel like you want to dance? The thought passes through my mind. God, you expect three million people to walk heading straight into this ocean bed. They're going to step into it with no evidence that anything good is going to happen as a result. So when you study the word, you hear Jesus rebuking his disciples because of their unbelief. And he asks them, where's your faith? Over and over again, it comes out of him toward those who follow him, questioning their ability to trust him. So is God unjust? Is he just mean-spirited? So he talks to his servant Moses, who has gone through so much up to this point in his life and service. He's exercised so much faith and spoken so clearly from God's word to the people of the Lord. No, it's not a rebuke to Moses. It's his father saying, why are you crying to me? You know who I am. Get up. Watch what I'm about to do. The Holy Spirit is speaking to many today. 
Why are you crying out in sorrow? Why are you living in despair and in depression? Have I failed you ever in the past? Did you not witness my faithfulness? Does it not count in this day of the test? The church has heard so many messages about faith, the word of faith, faith movements, every angle there is about faith that's been preached about. So when do we come to the place where we say, God, this time I will take a stand. I will not allow the devil to take me into the pit of despair. I will not allow this to take me down. There, there has to come a moment in our lives where we say like Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. This circumstance demands praise in this difficult day. Praise to God is essential. We need to offer God an ex expression of our faith, not our doubt and not our fear. The word records that Israel was overthrown by the Babylonians in their history. They were taken captive, many of them, because of their iniquities and their failure to honor God. And they, they were exiled in Babylon. As you read Psalm 137, you hear Israel expressing in the middle of their captivity. Alongside Babylon's rivers, we sat on the banks and we cried and cried, remembering the good old days in Zion. Alongside the quaking aspens, we stacked our unplayed harps. That's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking. Sing us a happy Zion song, they said to the Israelis. So the Israelis sitting there by the river, they had been known all over, from all over the world because caravans of traders had always come to Israel and they'd heard the joyful singing inside the walls of, of, of Jerusalem, the tambourines, the praises and the worship to the Lord their God, always boasting about the Lord God Jehovah, how he was their keeper, that he's above all other gods, above the power and the might of other gods. And here they are. They've hung their harps in the trees and they're weeping and they're crying instead of praising and worshiping. And their captive said, sing to us one of your songs from Zion. Can you imagine the thousands of God's people sitting there mourning and crying? And sometimes I'm concerned that many in the church are doing something similar. You see, in that day, they had lost their homes. They would lost business. They would lost family members. They had lost everything. And there is a time to weep for sure a period when we express and vent the pain that we're feeling and the grief that we're experiencing. I don't care what religion people practice, no matter what religion they, they have their faith and trust in, none of them can produce this essential praise to the Lord God because we have hope. They cannot produce any joy. They cannot produce any peace. And that's why many religions attempt to gain their followers and keep them following them because of threat and guilt. There's no hope offered, yet they have heard that this God, our God, can take us through difficult days. This God puts a praise in our heart even when we face difficult times like today. Their captives came to them and demanded, we want to hear you sing. This generation is also demanding of us a song of praise, an expression of thanksgiving to the Lord. And if ever a generation needed to hear from God's people, it is today, because many are empty today. People are depressed, not handling isolation very well. Some are attempting to drown their pain, their losses, through fear, in drugs, alcohol, anything to escape the realities of this spirit of oppression that seems to be across our nation. As you watch them, you can see it on their faces. You can hear the emptiness in their expressions. You can sense their hopelessness. Their countenance depicts their empty hearts. This generation demands from God's people essential praise, a certain sound that should emanate from the heart of every person 
who is a follower of the Lord Jesus. And our culture needs to hear from us. It says in Babylon, they demanded a happy song. Well, how can you praise? How can you have joy with something in your heart is questioning, how am I going to make it? Times are so uncertain and we're questioning God like the Israelis did when they approached the Red Sea. We have a plague. Our lives forever are disrupted. There's upheaval in our lives and in our government. The question arises out of the spirit of fear, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen next? How am I going to make it in these days? Well, we realize we have hope. It's the only hope. The church has the only message of hope on this planet. It isn't just a miracle people are needing to see today. Yes, it speaks volumes when a miracle happens and the incurable are made well and whole. Yes, that gets people's attention. And I believe in a miracle work in God. And we at Calvary Christian Center have watched God do physical miracles here among us. We will see more and more of God's power in these desperate times. God is going to show himself strong among his people. But in addition, this generation needs to see something like what's in our hearts as well. People have gone through something. We have weathered the storm. We've come through the test. This generation needs to see and hear hope expressed in our praise and thanksgiving and faith in God. This generation, as that generation, demands praise, a song of thanksgiving. So Calvary, we need to set our minds that he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on the Lord. Calvary, we need to fix our minds because the battle's being fought right here between our ears. Our will has to be involved. And no matter how dark, no matter how unbelievable it gets, something in our hearts has to rise up with essential praise to the Lord because God responds to the praises of his people. And the Holy Spirit asks the question to we, the church, will you believe me through what you can't see and what you're fearing? I don't want to stand before God on that day with a history that's been filled with fear and doubt and unbelief. I want to drop that backpack of fearful thinking, a spirit that some have allowed to take root. The Babylonians walked away dismayed. They're just like us. They're no different than we are. They're just, they're just incapable like we're, we're facing. No difference in people who have become faithless no longer trusting their God. Because in their minds, the Babylonians are looking at them and thinking, well, where is their God? Absent was essential praise in the hearts and lives of God's people. Today, there are many who have lost their jobs. Some wonder if businesses will ever open that they've been a part of for a number of years. So they're emailing their resumes. Nothing seems to materialize doesn't seem to be an immediate hope in the future. So they're filled with fear and hopelessness to be unemployed, not to be able to find work. It affects for, for the males. It affects who they are, their personality, how they go about life, their families, future, hope. Everything starts to become shady and questionable. Uncertainty about church services. When are we going to come back together in this sanctuary and worship God? When people can go about and do all kinds of other things in our community. When can we come back and worship the Lord? What about school in the fall? What about our education? Fear you might contract coronavirus. Testing. Trials. I don't know the solution. I don't know what else to do. There's nothing physically we can do. But I do know this. What God needs now is a testimony of his people who will still praise him, essentially, no matter what it is they're facing. So all around you know that we're all facing the same kinds of tests, yet they don't hear us murmuring and complaining. 
But we have a testimony because if we just go through this test, murmuring and complaining like the rest of our culture, if all we do then is find eventually another job, then we haven't learned one thing in the middle of this test because other tests are coming. This isn't the only test we're going to face. And we're not going to pass the next test if we don't learn to pass this test. So instead of complaining, let's have hearts of praise to the Lord our God. So we're distinguished in our world from those that are railing at the plight they find themselves in. There's to be a difference in us, we who serve the Lord. So what does God want to say to us today? Well, there are those today who are bound by a spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit or tormenting spirit. It can put you into despair and you'll find yourself depressed. But I, I'm sent here today to tell you, you will come out of this. You cannot go another day going deeper and deeper into the bondage of fear because our God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. That's what the Holy Spirit is reminding us of. God led us, led us just as he led the people of Israel as they faced the Red Sea. He's leading us today. God has led us into the middle of our Red Sea, our test. And we are being led by the Lord through this test. And if we can't grasp this truth, we're never going to come out from under the bondage of fear. You won't come out of that pit until you acknowledge, Father, you have led me all my life. I testify to that. I don't understand why we're facing what we're facing, but I know I can trust you, so I praise you and thank you in advance. Listen, God responds to people who praise him because they have faith in him. And saints, if we don't take a stand against the powers of darkness, when you don't feel like praising, when you are tired of all the negative voices, but you still stand up and say no, and you take authority over the spirit of fear, because hell has unleashed against us in this present age a spirit of darkness, and the principalities and the powers of darkness we are facing today are covering our land. Satan knows we stand on the cusp of the greatest move of the Holy Spirit since the book of Acts. And he knows his time is short. He knows his days are numbered. He knows he cannot prevail against the church. So he's loosed a multitude of evil spirits all throughout our land. And he's looking for anyone who is lingering in a puddle of fear. You become a target when you do that. And Satan uses fear to drag you into paralysis. He, he will get you to the place where you can't eat because you're fearful and knotted up, or you overeat trying to comfort yourself. He will take you to a place where even friends around you can't pull you out from the despair. So down, because you're bound by that spirit. Calvary, it's a spirit. So I'm led here with an anointing and a word. And the word is this, God has been with us in the past. He has never forsaken us. He has delivered us before. He's had his eye on us in the past, and he still has his eye on us today. God has never walked away from us, nor left us hopeless. And even if you can't see through the storm that you're in, you will emerge safely on the other side when you trust him, because your God will not fail you. He will not fail his word. And this is just that moment where you make that death to self decision. I will trust my God through this storm. Because once you break the back of that spirit of fear that binds you, you will have authority over all the future trials and tests that you're going to face. How long will we allow the devil to trample on our minds and on our thoughts, to bring on us fear and emptiness and loneliness so we, like those in Babylonian captivity, will have lost our praise and we've lost our song when Jesus said, I give you power to cast out evil spirits. 
I give you power over the devil. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Let me, let me give you another translation so it's even more clear. See what I've given you, safe passage as you walk on snakes and scorpions and protection from every assault of the enemy. No one can put a hand on you. Calvary, we ought to praise God for Jesus' promise to us. It's our time to rise up and take a stand. And I'm praying and I'm speaking against every evil spirit that's binding and blinding and paralyzing God's people, his church. It doesn't mean you're possessed when the enemy's attacking you, but it does mean you're harassed and you are distracted from the purpose for which we are here in our culture. The word says you can put Satan on the run. Let's turn and get him on the run. Let's turn and be sure he's hiding from us, not we being frightened of him. Therefore, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is God's word. It's not my word. It's his word. Each of you will put, a, put to flight a thousand of the enemy, for the Lord your God fights for you just as he has promised. That ought to elicit praise from your heart. We're not going to allow the devil to do this any longer to the church. And for those who do not serve Jesus, where do you go in the middle of this test? You are subject to the destruction of the devil where there is no comfort and no forgiveness and no hope for any deliverance. But for the saints, you praise him in advance because you know your God. It's essential to coming out of this test with victory, waving the banner of the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what God has done for you in the past. You know how he came through for you when you faced other pressure. David reminded himself and built himself up in the Lord. He said, the Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this giant Philistine. Remind yourself of God's faithfulness. Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The doubting generation of Israel who kept questioning God in every test finally all died off in the wilderness. And a new generation learned a valuable lesson when they approached the promised land after wandering and, and, and following their ancestors until they were all gone, they come back to the banks of the River Jordan and they're ready to go take what God promised them. Once again, they face a swelling body of water and those who bore the ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped into the edge of the water that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose up in a heap. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stirred firm on dry ground. In the midst of the Jordan, and all of Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. They knew God's presence was with them. They had faith. They praised Him in advance before they entered the land. They stood firm, fearless. They were not going to drown, nor were they going to be overwhelmed. And they come up to the city of Jericho and the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or come in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark and each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you will march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the horns. And when you hear the priests give one long blast on their ram's horns, have all of the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Our trust in God for the future 
for the body of Christ, for the church, is to tightly shut up Satan, is to tightly surround him. We will, as they did, praise God in advance, and the walls will fall. Do we want this plague to lift? Do we want the walls to go down? Then it's time for us to learn to praise our God and express essential faith in him, the prince over this community, and all those legions that work with him can be delivered into our hands. We need to praise God in advance. And if you're being harassed by a spirit of fear, that's from your enemy. That's not from God. An evil spirit screaming in your head to bring to you despair and unrest and stress. God promised peace for his people. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him. In other words, praise him. Essentially pray and essentially praise him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Satan knows what's about to break, so he's countering and he's testing, but he shall not prevail. And if you're being attacked by a spirit of fear right now, take authority over that assigned evil spirit. Break his assignment. He will not bring you into the pit of despair. Take your stand. And if you take your stand on God's word, all the power of Jesus Christ is available to you to defeat this adversary. Well, pastor, that's just mind over matter. No, it's word over the devil. God's word is always greater than the word of our adversary. Thereby, thereby, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. In other words, even when I don't feel like it, even when the circumstances dictate that I shouldn't be doing that because I have a right to feel bad and a right to be afraid, no, let us offer continually the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's what God expects us to do. I was reading the other day in 2 Chronicles where the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Menuhites declared war on King Jehoshaphat in Israel. And Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah in Jerusalem, and he begins to pray, O oh Lord, God of our ancestors. He begins to praise God. You alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of the kingdoms of this earth. You are powerful and mighty, and no one can stand against you. He begins a posture of essential thanksgiving and praise to God. And then the king, it says, and God gives him exactly what to do, and the king appoints singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. See how essential this is? Now watch. This is what they, sing, they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At that very moment, they began to sing and give praise God caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. God confuses the enemy when we begin to praise him and honor him and shout to him of his greatness of an, and, and of his majesty. So when the army of Judah finally arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were the dead bodies of their adversaries lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. So King Jehoshaphat and his men went out and gathered and plundered. They, they found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder, it took them three days to collect all of it. On the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got that name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. They praised him in advance, which said to God, we have faith in you. And they praised him at the end of their victory and, and for all that he had done to help them and aid them in the battle and granted to them blessing greater than when they started. 
That was an act of thanksgiving to the Lord. Oh, that we should praise the Lord and bless Him with essential praise so we ought to stop the fear. And we need to start praising our God. Calvary Christian Center, God has the same kind of victories for us as He's always had for the people who love Him, trust Him, have faith in Him, and praise Him essentially in advance. Thank the Lord. It's been great being in service together. And I was thinking of the passage from Colossians, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. God has given us the victory through his son Jesus. And what that simply means is that over sin, over death, given us eternal life. Yeah, maybe you've been watching today and you felt a sense of hopelessness and you're, you're, you're oppressed by guilt and wondering what's gonna happen to you, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Well, why don't we pray together? Because we have a God who loves us and he's willing to forgive us and he's willing to wash us and give us a brand new start. So if that's the case, why don't you essentially begin to give thanks to God and recognize He's ready to receive you and pour his love into your life and change the direction of where you're going in purpose. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. You might want to say it with me right there at home. Thank you for your son, Jesus. You sent him to give his life for me, to be a substitute. When I deserve to die, he died in my place. And today I ask that I be forgiven of my sins that the blood your son shed will wash them away and pay the price for my failures. Give me a brand new life. Give me an opportunity to serve you. Give me the strength I need to go forward now and please you for the rest of my days because I have forgiveness of sins. I recognize I now have a purpose with my life and for my life and I have all of heaven ahead of me. I thank you in Jesus' name Amen. Praise the Lord. He's good to us. And as I was looking at that passage, I, I remembered that um, when the Romans would go off to war, a general would lead their armies out to war. And uh, after they had conquered their adversary, they would come back to Rome in a caravan. They would come through the Arch of Triumph. And as they came through the Arch of Triumph, of course, people were cheering and screaming, and the, the conquering general would be on a, on a white stallion, and as he came through the arch, behind him would be wagon loads of plunder that they had gathered from their adversaries, and at the very end of the line would be their, their king of the adversarial army that they had just defeated, all bound up and ready to be taken to the palace to re forever remain a servant to the emperor of Rome. That reminds me of what Jesus has done for us. He took care of every principality and power. He made an open spectacle of them. He showed everyone that he is the Lord and he is the King. So saints, as you're watching this today, once again, don't be afraid, but give thanks to God. He has you. He's got all of your situation covered. He publicly exposed your adversary as powerless. So like those citizens of Rome, we need to lift our voices to God and celebrate our conquering King and Lord of Lords. So lift your hands with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his peace. And one day soon, the conqueror of Calvary will break the eastern sky, riding that white stallion on returning from the clouds of glory, and we will celebrate the appearance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ours is the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise Him today.